now we are getting to the highlight of our lunch. And I have the great honor of inviting um, Maura English Silverman to come up and be our keynote speaker um, for, for lunchtime. And um, you should, well, um, Maura is the founder and executive director of um, the Triangle Aphasia Project Unlimited, that is called TAP, that's located in North Carolina. And she flew in this morning at um, 6 a.m in the morning to be able to be with us because she had a huge event at her aphasia center last night <laughs> and when I invited her to come and speak she said uh, without hesitation I will be there even if I have to get on a plane at five in the morning or six in the morning so um, so Maura thank you so much for coming and um, I um, don't want to take up any more time I want to um, give the podium over over to Maura. Um, Maura has had um, a lot of experience with aphasia in a lot of different ways and um, she will tell you all about that. Hi everybody. It's such an honor to be here um, and to be following these speakers, these award winners and to be able to be here um, at the invite of one of my mentors, um, Leora Cherney. So I really appreciate it. And it, you know, it, the whole idea of coming out to Chicago and talking about aphasia, my problem is probably talking too much about aphasia. Um, but as Leora said, my journey has been a little bit different than what I had pictured it to be. So I am um, somebody who, just like you, had the dream in mind, you know, I was gonna have the white picket fence, gonna get the dog, and I'm gonna have the two and a half children. I don't know where the half child comes from, but apparently that's what everybody wants, is a half a child. Um, and I also really wanted to be a speech pathologist. I mean, since I was, I thought maybe psychology, and then I, my very first year, I was working and I saw this, um, I was working at a hearing impaired preschool, just getting some experience. And um, there was a gentleman, I saw my old babysitter. She said, I said, what do you do here? She said, I'm a speech pathologist. I'm like, what is that? That sounds awesome. I'd love to talk. And she said, <laughs> she said, come on down here and you can watch me. And there was this gentleman in there. And I recognized him instantly as a leader in our business area in um, Binghamton, New York, where I grew up. And, she said, she introduced me and I saw him struggling for the words. And instantly I knew that man understood everything that I was saying to him and that he was struggling to get his message out. In that moment I said, this is what I want to do. I want to be a speech pathologist. So that part came true, but the rest of it all kind of went to, you know, in a handbasket. So, um, because I did, you know, get married and think everything was going fine and plan A turned into plan B. So this is my story. And we all have it. It doesn't always go perfectly, right? But I got a second chance, and I found love again in, um, in rehab, which I always say I met my husband in rehab, not the Lindsay Lohan rehab, like the, <laughs> he was a PA in rehab, I was a speech. He had two boys, I had one boy. We were both sarcastic, and I thought it would work out great. Um, and it did. And I remember saying to Steve, I told these, um, the people at the event last night, I remember saying to him, Steve, I have this dream. I want to start this aphasia program. And I've seen aphasia programs all over the country. At that time, there, were, there was only a handful um, 16 years ago. And I said, but I don't really just want to have a center. I want to be out in the community where people are. I want this kind of hub and spoke model. And when I talked about it, he said, what are you waiting for? I was like, oh, no, you don't understand. Like, I won't be making any money, honey. <laughs> like, the, you know this good job I have at Duke with the, you know, tuition benefits is, is gone. He said, you know what? You live once. Go and do it. So I had a good one. And we combined our families. And that same year, I lost my dad um, right after he retired. I had a baby boy, which was supposed to be a girl, but don't tell him because... <laughs> Other than the girl dog, it's all testosterone in my house. So Zach came into the family, and we started the Triangle Aphasia Project all in one year. And the family has been behind me all the way. 
and I was plugging along. I mean, if you build it, they will come. People, I started with two groups with 10 people, and within just two years, we were just having, you know, I was driving all over North Carolina. And then life changed drastically. When my mother, driving from, well, she was actually coming from her home in Pennsylvania to um, be off for Christmas. She was going to go see my aunt in Maryland and then come down and spend Christmas with us. Um, it was December 17th, and ironically, I was leaving my last group at, at um, Wake Med, which is one of the area groups we were leading. And my uncle said, have you talked to your mother? I haven't been able to reach her. I'm like, well, that's really weird. I'll call her. And he said, it's, you know, then I started psycho dialing her, you know, like just <laughs> keep calling and calling. He said, yeah, the last time we talked to her was about 1 o'clock, and she was saying, uh-huh, okay, 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 okay. It's like, and you didn't think anything was wrong there? Because <laughs> um, my mom likes to talk as much as I do. So um, the short and long story is that my mother had started, was on Coumadin, started a massive bleed in the left hemisphere of her brain, and eventually, after driving north on 81 going five miles an hour, was saved by the um, Pennsylvania State Police when they came in front of her and had that, her hit him, hit yeah, the cop. Um, and they saved her life. And he, the policeman called me, said, it looks like you've called a lot of times. <laughs> um, I said, yes, I'm her daughter. Is she OK? And he said, she's alive. But ma'am, I believe she's had a stroke. She can't move her right side. And she has aphasia. And I'm telling you, I looked up and said, are you kidding me right now? <laughs> and then I said, please hand her the phone. And he said, ma'am, I told you she cannot talk. I said, give her <laughs> the phone. And I said, Mom, you're going to be OK. We're going to be there as soon as we can. And I got in the car and drove to Hershey, Pennsylvania. So obviously, I was really angry. I was really upset. I dedicated my whole life. I was poor. I mean, like, P-O-O-R, poor, in my house. Because I believe so strongly in the right for people with aphasia to have services for as long as they wanted to. And while I was doing that, now I have to look at my mom starting from square run and going through this. And I used to call it the great cosmic irony, you know, amongst other things that I won't tell you because there are a lot of four-letter words. But over the last few years, I have realized that this has been a huge, huge gift from my mother to me and to my family and to the hundreds of patients that I serve at the Triangle Aphasia Project. And it is so ironic that it is exactly what she would have done. Is she what I was telling this table over here, my mother was a little bit on the martyr side, like would do anything for anybody, never said a bad word about anybody, would give her shirt literally off her back. But that's what she did for me. She taught me so much by going through this journey that it is exactly what she would want, is to be able to provide this help. So how can I call it a gift? Well, I can call it a gift because I learned compassion at a level. I mean, I always thought I was a pretty compassionate speech pathologist. Big difference. I learned empathy. I learned what it felt like to be on the other side. I learned a level of understanding. And even though um, my husband calls me the most patient per person on the planet, I think it's because I live with five boys. Um, but what I really learned, which I thought was fascinating because I got to go to the thing this morning, is I learned perspective. I learned a whole new perspective. And perspective is very important. For those of you who can't see that slide, because it's a little fuzzy, is there's an island and a guy in a boat. And, and the guy in the island's going, boat! And the guy that's on the boat is going, land! <laughs> so you know, it really is perspective. But it is perspective in not just understanding that you see the world in a different way and how your attitude is about it. But I, I really learned this long before my mom had her stroke. I was a very early speech pathologist, and I was seeing a little, I was seeing adults and children at the time, and I was seeing this little girl. She was adorable, six-year-old Jessica, and she had a little bit of a fluency problem, so she had a stutter. And I was working with her, and while I was working with her, her grandfather suffered a stroke, her poppy. 
and I was taking a second master's in ger gerontology at the time, and we were doing a project, and a family um, interview project. Well, Jessica was young, so I said to Jessica, I said, can you do me a favor and draw me a picture of you and Poppy, you and your Poppy, before he had his stroke? And this is the picture she drew. Afterwards, I handed her the same thing of crayons, and I said, now, show me a picture of Poppy after the stroke. Now, I don't know if you caught all the changes, but I had a wonderful art therapist that I was working with look at these two pictures. You guys notice anything going on in these pictures? Yeah, smaller. So he became smaller, she became taller, this is just a matter of, you know, the day before a stroke versus the day after a stroke. The art therapist pointed out things like, look, the sun is shining in both pictures. They still, in this picture, they had a destination. They were going to the gum store. And she was, her ponytails high up, carefree and happy. Here, it's the, uh, you know, Old lady ponytail, you know, the one, that, the one that we try to get away with if we're not going to the gym. Here. Look how long her arms are, how she took on more responsibility, but they're both still very happy and very smiling. And I thought about that when I thought about perspective. And I thought about how my perspective changed so drastically when my mom had her stroke. And not just in the roles and the things that we talk about um, in, in one of the things this morning we, uh, we were talking about, you know, is, is my mom still the authority figure? Is my mom still my parent? She can't give me the same advice she gave me before. Of course, all of that changed personally, but it also changed for me professionally. Because at the time, the Triangle Aphasia Project had a logo that looked like this. It was just a triangle <laughs> with a big A in the middle, right? And afterwards, we changed our logo to this because we realized that it's not just about the individual with aphasia, that when one person has aphasia, the whole family and all the friends have aphasia too, right? Right? And then also the community has to be taken into consideration when you talk about aphasia. I teach a lot of um, physicians and, and medical professionals because I strongly believe in this last thing, that um, when I go to a doctor, I want them to look at my mom and not look at me. So I spend a lot of time communicating with um, the community about how to speak aphasia is what we call it. And one of the things that I always say in the very beginning is, if you're in the forest alone and you have aphasia, do you still have aphasia? You, you know, you had a stroke and you have aphasia and you're for, in the forest alone, do you still have aphasia? And all the doctors are like, yes, yes, you have aphasia because it's a medical condition. You don't. Aphasia only breaks, it's that, that uh, tree knocking down in the forest thing. You only have aphasia when you go to communicate with somebody else. Otherwise, your thinking and your knowledge and your intellect and all of that, your thoughts, who you are and who, you, um, who your character is, is the same. So I started thinking about perspective as really a different lens. And when I think about lenses, I think about what they saw. And I'm telling you, this was heartbreaking because one of the things about my mom, and you will learn this in a future slide here, is that my mom did not like to go out with that. I mean, she didn't even go to Walmart with like sweatpants on. I mean, the woman was always dressed with the scarf and the earrings and the, you know, she really, and this is what they saw. Two bumper nose, hairs like this, and boogers hanging out of this, you know, it's a mess. And they looked at her and this is, these are the words they saw. But what we knew was that woman. And I knew that they didn't know anything about her. They didn't know these things. They knew how old she was. They knew what her medical condition was. They knew she had lost her husband. But she didn't know she had just crawled out of a depression of losing her best friend and was now back doing amazing things. As a retired nurse, was volunteering at the Cultural Center and at the um, Association for the Blind reading um, the newspaper. She loved shopping. She loved throwing parties. You know, this is the woman I wanted them to see. 
which is very hard in the HIPAA days of not being able to write things all over the wall, but I did anyway. So when the nurses would walk in, they'd see a big sign saying, meet Joan. She has 10 grandchildren. Her husband recently died. She's a nurse. Like, yep, you're going to stand there and read all that. <laughs> it's really funny because right now she is um, in a skilled nursing facility after breaking her hip. And I have these giant post-it notes. I mean, you know the big ones, like the heavy, sticky, that says, please close the bathroom door. That's a, it's like a dignity thing to me, right? She's eating in the same room that you know, our bathroom's in. And I'm like, how big did these post-it notes have to be before one of you guys just closes the bathroom door? Anyway, back to perspective. I want to know, and you guys know this, but why was it so important for me, for them to see my mom in that last slide? Why is that so vital to us? For us to be able to kind of you know, fill them in on who she was. Because it's not who she was, it's who she is. And it is essential that we communicate who she is. Reminds me of when my mom was on um, rehab, I was in her room and I was helping her with something when we were waiting for a nurse. And I heard a therapist go into the room across the hall. And this woman was sitting in the chair and I could tell the therapist was looking at all the cards and pictures that were on the wall. And she says, and I mean loud, like I heard it in the opposite room, oh my gosh, Miss So-and-so, you were so pretty. <laughs> OK, right then, I would have been like, OK, where's the nearest window that I can jump out? <laughs> it is very important to us for people to realize it's is, not was. Because this is what we believe. No, I take that back. This is what we know that nobody has a right to tell you how far you're going to go, that the brain makes remarkable changes, and that if you see a doctor who tells you that three months, six months, a year is all you're going to get, turn around, walk out, and go find a, a doctor who knows what they're talking about. Because we can be trainers of cells. We can rewire the brain. One of the books that um, Melanie had mentioned in her group this morning was The Brain That Changes Itself. And some of the stories about how the brain can be rewired are more than remarkable, they're possible. And I think that's really important. And while we could sit here and talk about 10 neuroplastic principles and all of the things that I'm very passionate about, I will say that it's the stuff that makes sense to us. If you don't use it, you're going to. Thank you. And that saliency matters. It needs to mean something. So of course, everybody always said, oh, your mom is so lucky to have you. <laughs> I don't think my mom was thinking, <laughs> I'm so lucky to have this girl who's got this a plan for me, uh, <laughs> because I definitely had a plan for her. But I also had a plan for TAP, and I wanted to think about how I could apply the individual, God bless you, the community, and the, or the individual, the family, and the community. And I just want to share what we did with my mom with each three of these areas and how this might mean something to you. So the very first thing is the individual. How am I going to make sure that my mom's therapy mattered? Well, the very first thing is, and I wrote an article years ago called The Dignity of Struggle. I'm very passionate about the fact that you have to struggle. Sorry, it's hard, <laughs> you know, but you have to struggle to get better. Um, but one of the things is, is this is a life change. You know, she was shocked when she got down to PT the very first time. And I remember being at um, one of the hospitals up in, um, or down in North Carolina after we moved her from Hershey Medical Center. And they, um, I finally had a good night's sleep, and I ran up to rehab, it was about seven, and they were on her way taking her down to therapy. And she was sitting in the wheelchair, and she looked like a mess. I mean, like, she looked like bed head to the max, and she had the tube up her nose, and now she's got a gown on. She wasn't even in clothes yet, because I hadn't, gotten her broader clothes yet. And she was so in a gown with the back wide open and a diaper, right? The last thing she remembers, she was on her way to go visit family. And they, I said, wait, where are you going? They said, well, we're taking her down to PT. I'm like, oh, 
no, you're not <laughs> taking her down to PT. They was like, what are you talking about? We have to, we got the three hour rule, you know, you gotta get the three hours. I said, no, 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 if you are gonna have my mom see herself for the first time, you're gonna pull her up in front of a big mirror and see her for the first time, We're get, I need three minutes. And I did the quick wet the hair, and you know, the little eyeliner and makeup and lipstick and we did the best we could. <laughs> Um, but what we wanted to do is how are we going to compensate for what's not working now and then how are we going to make sure that the rehabilitation is focused on things that is important to her is that we reminded her that as good as we are and we're good speech therapists we're good but we're not brains you know we're we're just people communicating. Life is therapy. Therapy is not your life. We have so many people who just wait for their next order for speech therapy or wait for the next miracle speech therapy. That is not what it's about. It's about engaging in life fully because that's the best therapy. So the very first thing that we started doing is do all the things that you loved doing before, mom. You loved getting greeting cards. Those are the first things she did was write uh, greeting cards, um, signing her name to that. And I remember going down to occupational therapy. And they were working on um, putting nails and screws into little cups. OK, she was working on that right hand. And she was asleep. I mean, like drool, you know. She was, I said, what is going on? <laughs> they loved when I visited, by the way, if you can't tell. <laughs> They're like, oh, there she is again. Um, so I go, um, what's going on? They said, well, your mother's very tired, and she's not participating. And actually, one, the aide said she's being noncompliant. <laughs> like, well, my mother's never seen a nail and a screw in her life. I mean, she's a nurse. She can give you a shot. But you know, my dad took care of all the service stuff. So if you want my mom to participate, it needs to mean something to her. So I took a cold washcloth, woke that woman up, and said, we are getting your three hours in here. Because I was worried. I worked in rehab. I knew they would discharge her. So um, I said, you know what? You want her hand to move? You want those fingers to move? Go back to that first slide of all the stuff about my mom. She was raised Catholic. She said the rosary every single day, twice if you had a headache, you know, and told her, you know, <laughs> something was going on, she would say it again. She knew like all those little mysteries. She didn't even need a book. She just did it. I gave her the rosary, and you could see her hand. So I mean, I could see the brain cells working because the hand was trying to push that bead and trying to push that bead. And guess what her first words were? A prayer because she was saying the rosary. So we want to make sure that the, her um, therapy was meaningful and salient. And yes, we brought her home, and I paid her back of all the chores I had as when I was <laughs> a teenager by having her wash off the table with her right hand, um, because I wanted to make sure she was um, using her story. So obviously, I'm a speech pathologist. That should be kind of easy. Actually, her other daughter, my other sister's a speech pathologist. Um, again, the dream team, right? Two speech pathology daughters, her brother's a lawyer, and my brother's a lawyer. So, oof, we were the favorite family in <laughs> rehab. But I went back to my speech roots, and I said, look, I'm going to go through my bag of tricks, and I'm going to make sure. I'm going to use all the tr same tricks I use with individuals that I see who are not related to me. I'm going to find out what their biggest concerns are. I'm going to develop hierarchies. I'm going to role play those um, barriers. But you know what? I'm not perfect, and I used all the tools. Um, and, but things are different when it's your mother. It's just different. Because while in dignity of struggle, I tell people, it's OK if they struggle while they're working on that communication. You can cue them, but don't you know, throw the baby away with the, do people say that? Baby away with the bathwater? It's an awful saying. Anyway, don't give it all to them. Make it make work a little bit. But it's harder when it's your family. Here's my mom who gave me all of my advice, helped me through the roughest times of my life. I'm watching her struggle, and I know what she's saying. I feel kind of cruel sitting there and not helping her, but to know I'm helping her by not helping her. Well, it is really all about communicative accessibility. And what I want to prove to you is that uh, we all make mistakes. So I want to show you some thing that I brought along and uh, give my big speech therapy fail moment is that um, I went into, and this is years after my mom has had her stroke. She still has um, some aphasia. And she was in a facility that there's two beds and two um, 
closets. And I walked in one day, and she had a navy blue top on with black pants. OK, for anybody who was brought up in her generation, that's like wearing white after Labor Day. She's like, she looked at me, she goes, oh, Mara. Oh. <laughs> I said, Mom, why don't you just dress yourself? Like, pick out your own clothes. I know it's hard for you to dress yourself, but why don't you just pick out your own clothes? And she goes, I can't. And of course, at TAP, we have a jar that says, I can't. And if you say it, you have to put a dollar in it. So I was like, you better watch, Mom, because you're owing me a little money right now. She said, no, I can't. And I said, why not? And she points to the closet door. And I noticed that at the base of the bed, the door only opens to the end of the bed. Like, literally, she cannot access her closet. So she had no ability to pick out her own clothes. So for probably three months that she was in that facility, she had been wearing these god-awful combinations of outfits. And here as a speech pathologist thinking I knew you know, some expert in aphasia. Um, so what did I do? I grabbed every single piece of clothing out of her closet <laughs> and took a picture of it, made a little PowerPoint, which I brought along to show you, put it in one of these little you know, uh, sleeves, hooked it up on a command hook, and every day, except today since I stole it from her room, <laughs> God knows what she's wearing today, um, she is able to pick out her own clothes. And it, it, says, it just says, please help my mom dress herself. The thing is, my mom can read. So when she sees it written, she will be able to tell the story of what she needs, which is why we do a lot of those kind of um, programs with her. Accessibility actually has to be there, not <laughs> like I did. All right. Now, community, friends, family. This is particularly difficult, and I don't know how many people experience this, but many people in my area, North Carolina, weren't in North Carolina when they had their stroke. Their daughter, their son, somebody lives in North Carolina, and their family um, has to move them there. So they had to move my mom from Scranton, Pennsylvania, not knowing a single soul. So all my friends became her adopted children. All my um, kids' kids became their gr grandchildren. But her friends were still very close. So how was I going to maintain those connections? Because one of the things we hear often is that people with aphasia miss their friends. They feel lots of times that they are isolated socially. I'm going to tell you some of the things that um, we did to do that. But I also wanted to make sure that she still was tapped into all the things that made her her all of her passions, all of her interests. And so anytime we had an opportunity for her to help with a party, she was in an independent living facility after she got done with rehab. And I said to them, you guys have parties all the time, St. Patrick's Day party and an Easter party and a this party. Why don't you have my mom help you out with that? She loves to do that. And it allowed her to access some of those things. And then how can we create some new connections for her? The first thing I did was I really published kind of her story, told everybody that I met about her. Um, we purchased a just a single white binder. We called it her journey binder. And we put in her story so that every time she met someone, she could tell somebody her story. We also, back in the day, there was something called Care Pages. It is no longer available, but Caring Bridge still is. And now a lot of people use Facebook groups. Let me tell you what we did with that. We started this actually while she was in the hospital up in Hershey, Pennsylvania, when everybody was calling me saying, what's going on? You know, how's she doing? And I was, for the millionth time, to her thousands of friends, well, my, she's back in surgery, and this is what's going on. I was exhausted. I couldn't do it anymore. So what we did was we got care pages, and we just kept updating people that way. Did anyone use something like that? Yeah. So one of the cool things about these um, venues or these avenues is that you can provide aphasia education and support via these avenues. So on her care pages, what I would do is I'd write a little thing. My mom has aphasia. Aphasia is. This is and you can put, upload videos to it. You can show exactly what she's doing. And it started out with us updating it. And then later on her journey, she'd made her own progress reports, which was kind of cool, too. But one of the th stories that it reminds me of is that my mom was getting lots of cards. I mean, these friends of hers liked to write greeting cards, like keeping Hallmark in business. Um, but 
they all also had 70 year old handwriting and they would start talking about their kids or what was going on and my mom really couldn't follow what they were saying so i got on care pages and i said mom loves to receive your cards thank you so much but you know what she's having a little trouble with reading could you please print them or type them out and in addition if you could just throw a picture in there so that she knows who you're referring to and label it that would be great the very next mail we never got another card with the you know crappy handwriting <laughs> Um, and we really empowered her friends to learn about aphasia. And they stopped believing that I was just the meanest daughter on the planet and realized that I was really trying to help her. At TAP, we use Shutterfly, which is a team site. And all of our clients that want to participate in this will do the same thing there. And they'll have a whole team that they can keep in touch with. And I can share more of that another time. Um, but that's also very personalizable, so you can do videos and stories and such. Okay, I'm running low on time, so I'm okay. The, la the last area that we want to make sure is, you know, how can I use the lessons that my mom is giving me to help with the community? Um, and particularly, people talk a lot about when you go to doctor's offices or to other therapists, making sure they know how to communicate with you. Well, one thing that consistently happened was my mom unfortunately developed a seizure disorder with her since she had her brain surgery and would often need EMS calls. Has anyone ever had EMS show up at their house? How many yes, no questions does the EMS guy start firing at somebody who, by the way, doesn't answer yes and no's correctly? <laughs> and she just had a seizure, and now you're barreling those questions at her. So a lot of the things what we needed to do was advocate, advocate, advocate. And for me, it's because people with aphasia are more communicatively vulnerable than people that don't have aphasia. Of course, I'd like to have everybody know what aphasia is. I had a consultant once come to TAP who said to me, oh, I love this, you know, this nonprofit you're doing. It's really good, and I like Triangle because you're in the Triangle area of North Carolina. But you've got to get rid of that word aphasia. Nobody knows what that means. <laughs> That's kind of the point. Um, at TAP, it's very easy. We have lots of programs to educate the community. We talk to Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts. We have a children's program. We do volunteerism all over. Our, our clients volunteer at um, a whole bunch of agencies every time educating people. We talk at um, uh, civic organizations. And the people with aphasia are the experts, so they help us with the training. They're the ones who are there helping. So it's easy at TAP to do that community training. It's harder when it's the individual um, person. It's a little more challenging. But it's not impossible because there are so many teaching moments, so many opportunities that happen in life where you can teach people about aphasia. And some of that has to do with a little preparation. And what I mean by that is my mom and I don't go to the doctor unless it's an emergency without spending a half hour the day before preparing. What do you have to prepare? What, did, what questions would you like to ask mom? Let's use some supportive communication tools. Let's draw the body. Show me what you want to ask about. And then we write down the sentences. And we practice them like the scripts that these people practiced this morning and that perspectives was amazing. A half hour worth of work before makes the doctor's appointment be about you the person with aphasia, instead of where I literally have sat next to my mother and they've said, how's she doing? We can stop that. We stop it by showing patience. And we model it by showing care and concern. And we also do it by sharing your story as much as you can to every doctor, to every person out in the community. This morning, I was on um, Facebook at 4.30 in the morning <laughs> in the airport. Um, and I saw that the Phasia Recovery Connection posted this. And I thought it was kind of interesting. It says, the scars you will share, I'm going to need my readers. Um, the scars you share become lighthouses for people who are helping, headed for the same rocks that you hit. What I thought about with that was sometimes you need to completely unwrap a gift to try to figure out what really the value of that lesson was. 
And on behalf of my mom, behalf of the people at the Triangle Aphasia Project, I'm so honored that you guys let me ha take some time today to share our story with you. Thank you. Wow, that was an amazing story, um, and um, so thank you for your perspective. Um, we are running a little bit over time, but if anybody, I think we could take maybe one or two comments or questions, um, and then um, we're going to break at um, 2.15, and we'll start our next sessions at 2.30. So we can take just a couple of questions or comments if there are any. And we, need, and we need to give you a mic because if you want to share, we want everybody to be able to hear what you have to share. So, um. Maura, I know you live out of state, but for anybody who lives in the Chicago area, I hope you've heard of something called Smart 911. Um, it's referring to exactly what you're talking about, about um, EMTs coming to your home. So basically, Smart 911, um, look it up, it's actually to smart911.com, and if you go on to it, you can fill out all of your family information, so if you ever were to dial 911, they know exactly if someone in your family's had a stroke, what medications they're on, they have trouble speaking, etc. so they know that ahead of time. Great. I, I don't have a mic here, hold on. Oh, no, I've got to take this off. Okay. Uh, we don't have, okay. that one's on. We don't have the same exact program in North Carolina, but I will say that we that one of the things you really want to make sure is that you have ID on you, not just the card that says I have aphasia, but I also suggest people get something like road ID or a medic alert bracelet. You can personalize those to say, I mean, the road ID is like $14 and they're kind of sharp looking. People use them where runners use them. And you can say um, that the person has aphasia on there. And then I have a, we made a visor card that we keep in um, our clients' cars so that if anything happens to, to somebody in the car that they're able to know what aphasia is. And also on your tables, you have um, our, our cards. This is either for on a key ring or for in your wallet. And please feel free to take it. At the back, you can write your name and an emergency contact number. Um, so um, you know, make sure you always have something that shows that you have aphasia. Um, are there any other um, comments or um, in anything else? Um, <laughs> Thank you guys so much. Okay. I appreciate it. It was wonderful. Yeah. yeah.